Now, submission on gender-based violence bills by Economic Freedom Fighters Delegation, Commissar Sharon Letlape, Commissar Mbali Lamini, and Fighter Leanne Mateis, led by the Deputy Secretary General, Commissar Popi Mailola. Now we will start with our submission and it will be presented in the three bills. I will do the first one and my other colleagues will do the two other bills. We would like to first thank Parliament and the Portfolio Committee on Justice for inviting us to make this presentation here. Even though we are the third largest party in this country, we here in Parliament. We thought it prudent to come make this presentation here to emphasize just how important this work is for us. The work to need at the back, the pervasive nature of gender-based violence, it's critical for the survival of women in this country and therefore the survival of the nation as a whole. The scourge of violence against women, children, and lesbian, gays, bisexual, queer, transgender, intersex, disabled, and elderly people in this country is out of control. These violent practices may have received media attention in recent times, but have been perpetuated for generations and are deeply rooted in this country's history. The vicious cycle of triple oppression based on race, class, and gender has not been broken for black women in particular. As a consequence of pervasive patriarchy and sexism in our country, it is black women in the main who suffer the most from gender-based violence. The high levels of GBV that women face also reflect violence against sexual and gender minorities and people with non-normative bodies. In particular, corrective rape results in significant harm to lesbian, gay, and transgender people, as it is not just a sex crime, but a hate crime as well. It is estimated that 21% of women over the age of 18 years have experienced violence by a partner. In the South African and African context, GBV is widely used to refer to the violence waged against women, in particular because they are women. This violation ranges from verbal insults held at women in the streets to actual physical assault, rape, and the murder of women. In our founding manifesto, our position against gender-based violence is strongly made. The founding manifesto says, the EFF is against the oppression of anyone based on their gender, gender expression, or sexual orientation, meaning, meaning that we are against patriarchy, sexism, and homophobia in all of its manifestation. We are also against tribalism and religious and cultural intolerance. We oppose any cultural or religious practices that promote the oppression of anyone, especially groups that have been historically oppressed by such practices. The EFF will emphasize transforming the lives of our people in the ghettos from one of the generalized structural violence as a mechanism to end all violence, including violence against women. Our submissions, criminal law, sexual offenses, and related matters amendment bill. We welcome the inclusion of the National Register for Sex Offenders and the prohibition of having these sex offenders working anywhere they will be in contact with vulnerable people. We feel that this could be more explicit. However, Section 2 of the Act should be tightened to make it explicitly clear that the National Register for Sex Offenders is for anyone who has committed sexual offenses and that these offenders must be barred from working with women and children, not just vulnerable groups. The definition of vulnerable groups may leave space for mistake and for mistake to be made. 
we submit that there must be an additional subsection which states that there will be an alternative register for people who are accused of sexual offenses whose case are still active. We welcome the expansion of the definition of incest to include cases where a child is sexually violated, even if there was a consent. But we submit that people found guilty of this offense must be found guilty of rape too, because a child cannot give consent. The definition of a person who is vulnerable in amended section 40C of the bill, it's very limited. From the list in the bill, women over the age of 25 are not considered vulnerable. Our submission is that all women, regardless of age and class, are vulnerable to sexual offenses. The provision for, for removal from the register of sex offenders provided by section 51 is not um, supported. We submit that people must only be removed from, from the register while only when, exon when the court exonerates them. Offenders must stay in that re register, uh, what is happening? in that register for life, okay? The amendments to section 54 are very progressive, but we feel that they should be expanded further to include an obligation to report sexual crimes against women generally, not just children and people who are mentally disabled. Lastly, we submit that there must be an addition to the list of sexual offenses in the act. This include sexual cohesion by a partner, forced marriage, ukutwala, also where a widower is forced to marry a husband's relative after his death, ukungenwa, stilting, refusal to pay sex workers for service rendered and sex for jobs. Now I will hand to my colleague, for Mr. Sharon Letlape to tackle the next bill. Submission on Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Bill. We welcome the amendment to both the Magistrates Act and the Superior Courts Act to allow for intermediaries to enable younger witnesses suffer from a range of conditions that make it inconvenient for them to testify and be cross-examined. This will be a crucial intervention in the quest for justice. We note the stringent conditions, the amendments to Section 59, 59A and 60 of the Criminal Procedure Act concerning the granting of bail for those accused of sexual offences. These amendments, however, do not go far enough. It still leaves loopholes that offenders can use to get out of jail, and it discounts the toxic nature of society and families in particular who may coerce victims of these crimes to testify that they have no problems with having perpetrators granted bail. Our submission is that there must be no bail at all for those accused of these crimes and sexual offenses accused should be categorized as sex at schedule five and six. They must only be released by the court at the end of the trial if found not guilty. The amendment to section 299 of the Criminal Procedure Act must not include provisions for parole for those convicted of sexual offenses and murder of women during the commission of sexual offense. This is important. We submit anyone found guilty of sexual offenses should be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The presidential pardon should not include those convicted of sexual offenses. I will now hand over to Komisam Bali. Submission on Domestic Violence Amendment Bill. We generally welcome the expanded definitions to domestic relationships and domestic violence. We are particularly happy that the definitions of domestic violence now includes coercive behavior and forced entry into places of residence and places of work without approval. The obligations created by amendments to sections 2A and 2B are comprehensive and will establish a societal pact to report cases of domestic violence to the police. We are also happy with the amendments of Section 3 and 3A of the Act. 
which allows peace officers to effect arrest without a warrant and to enter premises without a search warrant if there's a reasonable belief that a crime of domestic violence has been committed. The sections dealing with the protection orders are also comprehensive enough, and we are in support of these amendments. DSG? Um, now, in conclusion, we acknowledge that various interventions must be made to uproot patriarchy, sexism, and reaffirm women's position in society. However, matters of gender-based violence are prevalent and need to be addressed immediately. This legislative proposition will go a long way in curbing the violence meted out against women. But this must be accompanied by other commitments by both the executive and the legislature. There must be a way of holding those responsible for operationalizing these laws accountable. Parliament must be an activist parliament against gender-based violence and take proactive decision to hold the executive to account on the implementation of these laws. In principle, we support these bills, provided the amendment we propose are taken to account. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the EFF um, for the presentations, and you're within time. I will now note uh, hands from the honorable members who would want to ask questions of clarity on the presentation that has been made by the EFF. I have noted honorable Yoli Swayako, honorable Kola Mola, um, honorable Jekim Fuking. Uh, let me check if there are other members. Uh, let me check the chat. No one. Okay, let's take the hands in that order. Let's start with, uh, okay, Honorable Kubu Dilejanji. Let's take uh, Honorable Yoliswa Yago as the first one. Um, thank you very much, Kay. Um, I feel like after Honorable Yanji has spoken, I might have to have a second bite because I'm sure. Um, something will go down there. Um, but um, I'm grateful for the EFF for bringing this. And Squaz, um, I would like to thank the EFF and its delegation for coming and making a very comprehensive and um, a, a very forward-thinking report to us as the committee. Um, I also want to highlight some issues that I think have not been touched mainly um, which are the rural practices that are done um, that do um, oppress women, such as Ukutwala or Tena. Um, we hardly ever speak about those issues which oppress women generally, and they oppress children as well, and border on, on incest, they border on, um, you know, as rape. So I, I'm glad that we as the EFF have proposed that that be stopped. Secondly, the fact that the sex register should be on um, for life unless you are otherwise acquitted by the court. And lastly, I think that the executive, in particular the police, through the Minister of Police, should be held accountable for any amount of neglect on issues that are raised, on um, cases that are raised um, that are not taken into cognizance by the police. That should be taken very seriously by the community, but, all, but also the justice system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Yako. Honorable uh, Kolangola. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, welcome the presentation, Chair. Uh, uh, Honorable Mola, I'm not sure. Yes. You are very dark there. Now it's fine. Can you see uh, me now? Sir? You can see you properly now. All right, thanks. Uh, just, just, uh, just one, one or two issues. Uh, one uh, with the 
regard to the call for no bail for uh, perpetrators of GBV. Uh, the, the current legal framework of the country, which uh, has got the constitution as the supreme law, uh, stipulates clearly that uh, any law uh, or conduct that is inconsistent with the constitution is invalid. Now let's uh, let's let's go to to section thirty five of the constitution, uh, which uh, affords every accused or detained person a right to 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 be given bail, uh, which equally affords an accused person or denied, detained person uh, a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Uh, I would, I would, I would, I would uh, presume that uh, the EFF is aware of that. Then, uh, in 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 us crafting this legislation, how do they think we must balance that this legislation with the constitution that provides for such uh, 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 for such rights for for the accused and the and the detained? Uh, the last one. Uh, uh, is that uh, the last part of the presentation says uh, the EFF supports this uh, these bills, uh, provided their recommendations are taken con- are considered to be part of the bill. Uh, maybe just uh, uh, a little comment on it that the lawmaking process starts, it's now here in the committee, it goes to the National Assembly, it goes to the NCOP, uh, which uh, uh, some may, may, may believe that we may have been harsh or something. They may alter some of the provisions that were made in the bill. Uh, it may come out uh, with not everything that they submitted as the EFF. Will they then uh, withdraw their support if such uh, happens in the entire process of lawmaking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mola, Honorable Jekim Fuking. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thanks for the presentation from the EFF. I just want to uh, uncover, Chair, on the issue of the bail that uh, was raised by Honorable Mola. I want to check on the issue of parole that uh, people who are actually convicted, convicted on uh, sexual offenses should not get parole. I want to check if they really check on the parole system and are they happy with the parole system that is currently in place. The second part will be on the disciplinary of SAPS members who don't comply. Do you suggest uh, there should be an oversight and who should do it? Because uh, there is something about uh, those that don't comply. And on the issue of the, uh, the orders, do you agree with uh, those organizations that says the orders should be centralized. Noting a number of issues, among others, is that we have serial perpetrators or abusers. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I think he's frozen. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Honorable Mfuking, Honorable Kubu Telechanche. Thank you you very much, uh, uh, Slav. And let me also thank uh, uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters uh, with the the leader of the delegation uh, and the team for their presentation. Uh, I want to welcome it. I just want to make a few comments, Chair. Um, I think the first comment to make is we have listened to the ANC Women's League. Uh, We're now listening to the EFF. These are the two political parties that have come forward so far. I'm aware you are going to have a provincial government of the Western Cape, and I'm looking forward to that. But I think that the point we made, Chase, that uh, this is a societal challenge. 
and we can only defeat it uh, if we, we take these matters uh, of patriarchy, of uh, lack of emancipation of women seriously, all of us. And, and, and with that, I wanted to check first with the EFF delegation. <clears throat> uh, there is a pattern, uh, DSG, that uh, we have these laws and yet problems are continuing. You, you continue to have women raped and all sorts of things done to them. Um, with the laws in existence, yes, what we're doing now, we're tightening these laws. Has the EFF thought about beyond the issue of tightening laws? Was I was looking forward to hear that from the EFF. What else must we do as society uh, to, to stop or to, to fight this, this scourge? Uh, because resources, money, or laws alone, you have raised up front the issue of patriarchy that we have in society. Um, and, and so if you can comment on that uh, first as to what uh, you want to leave us with in this committee beyond uh, the technical work that we must do in terms of the law. Um, the second point is a, is a request to yourselves as the EFF, just to follow up on Honorable Tola Ngola, that uh, you are enriching this work uh, of these bills that must become act and, and laws that are executed. The request therefore is because we, we, we have different ideas, people are going to share, people are going to engage. Let me give you an example so that you understand this request. A day ago, we had, two days ago, we had an organization called uh, freedom of religion for South Africa. And one of the points they were making was that we must remove the issue of spiritual abuse as part of the definitions. Uh, it's very possible that at the end we might not remove that definition. But I'm, I'm making that point to come to you in terms of this request that you see when you say you support this subject to us agreeing with everything else you have suggested. It means that everything else that is good about the bills that you might not have commented, when we table this, you will find yourself not supporting it because in the discussion and discourse, we, we, we might have come with different approaches and versions to what you were suggesting. So the request is, I think it will leave a, a, a bitter taste when you've done so much work and the, at the end, you leave us uh, with a gun on our heads about having to agree to this, you, that you will only agree if you say, I'm banani, you're going to loan down, Jay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Janji, Honorable Nomatemba, Masako Jele. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, also, thank you for the EFF uh, for coming and make a presentation, even though after they have given us problem of not uh, indicating that they, they will be doing it, and they will be coming for oral submission. But we forgive them, Che. That must not be done next time. <laughs> They will come hard on me, but I'd like to point of order. I'd like to point of order here. We did gain submission. And honorable member, honorable members, please. Um, can we just can we just focus on the presentation? Okay, okay. that was on the lighter notes, Chairperson. Let's, let's focus on the presentation. Thank you very no, much. 
let me welcome their presentations, uh, Chepes, and also the their support in, in in some of the 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 the, the areas indicated on the bills. But I I only have one or two questions here. Uh, on this one of saying all women are vulnerable, there is a view that it's not all all women above 25 are vulnerable. That's what the presenter said. I wanted just to find out because um, there's a view that uh, it's not all of them. And those women, they can speak for themselves. They can... Uh, when you 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 would clap that one with the issue of mandatory report, that those women can uh, uh, I'm just bringing them in one basket together with that uh, of uh, the issue of mandatory of mandatory report that uh, they must go and report for themselves. They must the the issue of mandatory report must not be allowed. Uh, people must just uh, be able to have confidence and go and report their matters. Uh, but Che, I want to hear their view because uh, maybe this might be uh, an issue that where we, we, we only look at one area of sector of women, women who can speak for themselves, women who can stand for themselves. Uh, but about what about those who can't, who can't do that? And uh, we know we're coming from the town where we hear every weekend there are women who are really screaming for help in our neighbors, want us uh, uh, to help them. But you find that uh, uh, at the end of the day, tomorrow, they are not prepared to go and report. And uh, there's this part that says there must be a, 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 a allowing people around that woman to go and report. But there are people who feel that no, those women, they must go and they must not, there must be no one who uh, uh, help uh, in that situation, Chairperson. I just want to hear their view. Though I just mixed issues, but can I hear uh, what, what is their view on that one? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, there are no further hands. Can I now uh, hand over to the EFF to, to respond to the issues raised? All right, um, thank you very much. Um, we will be responding to the questions. And I would like to start with uh, uh, the question, I think it's Honorable Janji, uh, on the issue of tightening the bill. What I would like to bring to your attention is that, Honorable Members, we are in this meeting right now and we are speaking in terms of tightening these bills. But what we need to acknowledge and accept is that these bills, they have not brought the solutions that they were intended to when they were drafted. We had these bills, it can be probably for 20 years, 10 years or five years in South Africa. But now it has not kept the raping of children and the killing of women and the violence against any any human being in South Africa. The reason is because why would we tighten a failed bill? We must agree that these bills have failed us as South Africans and is still failing women. Why would we want to take a formula that has failed and we want to tighten it up right now? What should be done? What we should be looking at right now? It's it's an issue of consulting or in an issue of a method of drafting new bills altogether. I know it might take time. How do we do that? We might have consultative meetings, community meetings, and also go to areas where these issues are happening and where the states are showing us a number of those issues. And we go and we seek solutions in terms of that. There are so many issues that are happening in South Africa. And what we, 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 we're failing to understand is the psychology, the mindset of the perpetrators. 
that how do you go and rape a three-year-old child? Number one, how do you go and rape an 80-year-old woman? How do you go and kill and stab and, and ban a woman? In all of this, as much as we've tried to read and uh, this bill and find solution as the economic freedom fighters on what, how we should amend them. They are not speaking in terms of the immediate intervention and immediate responses that we as the government, we should be looking into. So we need, we need serious intervention. This bills, they are there in black and white. When we go to the police, let's say we take the, 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 the justice system all together, we start with police. Number one, our police in South Africa, when women go to police station and they want to report cases of gender-based violence, it can be an insult, it can be sexual harassment, it can be rape. Women have spoken so many years that they are facing challenges in the police station. The problem, it might be honorable members, this police are not trained properly when it comes to dealing with issues of women and children. When they go for police training, they're in, their, in those um, uh, colleges, in Hammanskral or wherever, you find that the system has not done proper programs where they will be trained psychologically, emotionally to deal with such issues. Number two, when we look into our judiciary, 99% of gender-based violence cases in court are not prioritized. Most of these uh, uh, cases, are, people are being given bails. Reason is because it starts from police. Police are not investigating these cases, are not following up on the processes. For instance, I'll make just an example. For instance, we had a case in Orange Farm where a lady was stabbed and killed. We attended the funeral yesterday. May her soul rest in peace. What we find is that when the police came to the crime scene, they just took photos and took her body. They didn't, and then when the family went to wash her body at the mortuary and everything, they didn't even take the clothes that she was wearing during that day when this incident happened. And those clothes are an important factor in catching the perpetrators. And when we are following up the cases in terms of the forensic, the Gauteng Department of Police will tell us that about eight or nine police stations in the, in the Gauteng province or in the regions of Gauteng, they only go to one forensic um, a department, which is in Pretoria, and they have a backlog in terms of following up those cases. So that is where, as, as, as leaders, we must be able to look that we must go back to the drawing board and sit down and face all of these facts. Now, the NPA, our National Prosecuting Authority, when they go to court, when police are not giving them the necessary evidence and documentation, they are very much quick to say, uh, your magistrate, your honor, I would like to call for, for, for postponement. And it is us as women, as victims and families, to go back and say to them, please, can you follow up on my case? And then those prosecutors are telling us that, no, the police must do their, their job. We as women in South Africa, we are left alone to come and fight this plight that we are facing. And as parliament, we feel that you are very much clueless when it comes to dealing with issues that we are facing on a daily basis as women, because right now women in communities, you have seen it, they are saying enough is enough. You as honorable members, you must be able to say, let's face this thing head on. Let's make immediate intervention right now. Lastly, um, before I close and give to my other colleagues, I just want to br bring this very, very simple scenario, uh, honorable members, is that 
during the, 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 the time of COVID-19, the president and, and, and the government said now, we, we, we must go on lockdown because we are faced with a pandemic. What did the government do? It, it went and put regulations for us to follow as South Africans in terms of protecting ourselves. We had soldiers, we had police on our streets patrolling each and every day. We had to wear masks. They had to be programs and even adverts on TV for us to wear masks so that they made us understand Hore. Wearing a mask is protecting yourself and the other uh, human being next to you. But now, when we are dealing with this, eight women in South Africa get killed each and every day. About 10 or 11 children in South Africa get raped every day. Why can't we take the scientific approach that we have taken when we were dealing with COVID-19 and deal with it with this issue of women, because women are dying. If it has not happened to your family, honorable members, you have not lost a loved one, your sister, your child, your, your, your cousin, just be grateful because it is happening to ordinary South African. Thank you very much for that. I would open to my other fellow colleagues that will be able to respond to other questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to take on the issue of no bail. In as much as we understand that we are in a lawmaking process and the constitution doesn't also limit us to um, violate other rights with others. There's no right that must be prioritized over the other. Now, when we say we do not want sex offenders to get bail, it's because I think the law of South Africa is very much protective towards the perpetrators done to victims or rather survivors. You find that a three-year-old is raped, or rather a 16-year-old is raped, and she must still come back after opening a case. She must still roam the streets. After a day or two, the perpetrator has been arrested. The perpetrator gets released on bail. She must still find herself in the same space with that perpetrator in the same community because the rights of the, rights of the perpetrator is more important than the survivors. Now, when we say sex offenders, and I, we did not speak on just gender-based violence. We are stressing on sex offenders and femicide because those are the issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You cannot be raped today and find a, your perpetrator on the streets or have to share the same seat in a taxi with the same perpetrator two days or three days later. And this is what we find. You open a case as a victim and the perpetrator goes and gets bail. You grant them bail and the victim is not even given um, any form of um, counseling or whatever. If you go, if a perpetrator goes and opens a case, the police station is very casual about that. You find that um, the prosecutor or the whoever the investigating officer that is taking on the case is very casual on issues of sexual offense. And we are very worried on that because firstly, our, our victims or survivors do not get um, counseling. They do not get taken through a process of psychological assistance. The police stations don't have that. The courts don't have that. The only thing they are focusing on is the right of a human being or rather a perpetrator who has a right to bail and to be innocent until proven guilty. Now, the EFF is completely against bail of sexual offense, uh, offenders. And we are stable on that because we have found in three months we have been on cases of gender-based violence, and most of them have been sexual offenses, have been femicide, and those perpetrators continue to get bail and continue to get preference in terms of law. Um, and the South African law has never been on the side of victims. And that is why we are saying there must never be bail for sexual offenders, whether they are, they are found guilty or not. Sexual offenders must remain in custody until the trial has been taken, but rather we must also put in account what the victim or the survivor of that incident is going through. I think the law must not be on the side of perpetrators like it has been throughout the time. We must be able to look into what happens to the victim, what happens to the victim as an individual, what happens to a victim as family, what happens to those around the victim. 
You find victims who are continuously being threatened by perpetrators because they were given they have a right, or rather their rights are more superior than the victim, to roam the streets and be able to threaten them to say, I will deal with you, I will do this, I will do this. That is why at the end of the day, we find cases of sexual offense or gender-based violence being taken off. A perpetrator will threaten a victim. A victim gets to a point where they even want to go and take off the case and call off the case because, firstly, the process of taking on the case is very slow. And secondly, they they find themselves in very vulnerable spaces and find themselves having to share the same space with the perpetrator. And she finds herself not protected enough. She can't even go to the police station. A three-year-old can't go to a police station and say, but my uncle is consistently and persistently harassing me at home. So we submit and we're very um, stable on the fact that there must never be bail for sexual offenders. And we're not taking it back. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just to come in, um, it's uh, Leanne Matasia. Just to piggyback on what Commissioner Sharon was saying also in terms of the on allowing bail. The Constitution is not written in stone. There's nothing written in stone. So even if there's a conflict uh, in terms of us saying that we're not going to provide uh, not provide bail anymore to sex offenders, the Constitution can be amended. So I think that is a very weak argument that a whole member of parliament um, can, can bring in the, in the space that we are at the moment. So there's no constitutional rights that are going to be violated when we have perpetrators and victims of such horrific crimes every day uh, being subjected to the same thing. Um, the question in regards to our system on parole, on whether the orders should be centralized, on who should be responsible, I think as long as we have this ANC government, gender-based violence is never going to be taken serious. I mean, just the other day we were dealing with the case of a guy who has three gender-based violence cases in three different courts, and none of the courts knew about it. To a point that we had to intervene so the one court could know and then the uh, bail application had to be abandoned. So I don't know how we could be at this point even asking questions about whether a system should be centralized or not. I mean, it's something that should have happened a very long time ago. And I think it's only an EFF government um, that is going to take us to where we need to be in terms of eradicating this horrific uh, crimes of gender-based violence. Um, the honorable member who spoke about the societal, uh, that this is a societal challenge, I think that is just generally a cop-out. And we hear this a lot from the ANC because they, there is no will, absolutely no will to deal with these issues. The ANC is not only just an enabler of gender-based violence, they are also perpetrators which we have just seen recently in the Commission uh, of Gender Equality report where they have tortured women and no one has been held accountable for it. I mean, up to today, not one criminal case has been opened despite a chapter nine institution saying that a government has tortured women. So we will keep making excuses and say that it's everyone's responsibility in this entire country to fix gender-based violence cases where, which age group, there's three-year-olds that get raped. As our DSG said, there's 80-year-olds that are getting raped, there's 21-year-olds. So I'm not sure which country she's talking about and which justice system she's talking about that she could ask us that question. So maybe she can just clarify on that. And also just clarify, I wasn't sure what she meant about our view. It wasn't clear because she was raising a lot of things. I guess she was just trying to throw shade on our presentation. Um, she wanted our view on something, but I wasn't sure whether it was in relation to which age group, because we are very clear that all women uh, and children should be listed as uh, vulnerable groups. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, also, um, I want to add to the issue of having repeated offenders who are repeating the same crimes in a country that allows their rights to be prioritized over the people that perpetuate violence towards. I think it needs to be emphasized that we wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't have a, pro a problem sitting amongst a country that has a constitution that is well written, a constitution that addresses everything, but nothing is implemented properly and nothing is properly maintained. 
On the bail issue, the steps as, as it is right now does not even have the capacity to ensure that the bail conditions are being adhered to. They tell us of not having vehicles. They tell us of not being able to get to the crime scene on time. There are actual cases where the police only gets to the crime scene only days after the, the crime has been committed. And now the capacity of the state to deal with issues of violence has proven to not be there. In fact, we are assisting the state by saying that no bail should be conducted because to maintain that law and order is prevailed has not been sustained at all. Now, I also want to address that you cannot treat gender-based violence as a choir practice. The reaction and the trauma and that, that, that victims or survivors of gender-based violence have is not the same. It is also issued out throughout the family and the community in its entirety. So if a 25-year-old that can speak up on their own cases, it doesn't mean that all 25-year-olds can speak up on their own cases. And I think it is very redundant of us to treat cases of gender-based violence as if they are common, whereas they are not. They need to be treated uh, with the difference of cases that they are coming with. So on the issue of the parole system, um, the victim sorry. finds themselves sorry. being back in the same community. Sorry, 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 sorry ma'am. You only have one minute. We only have one minute left on this matter. If you can round up. Thank you, Chair. I think in this last minute, I will emphasize that to politicize gender-based violence, seeing the cases that we are meeting, not only on the media, the media, but cases we are getting on the ground, but for the ANC to come to this hearing and politicize us being here and trying to solve this issue of women and children being abused, being beaten, being killed on a daily basis is very, um, is very un- it's very unconstitutional, that's number one. If you want to add higher to constitution, follow the constitution by leading people correctly and wanting their safety to prevail first. It is very important that we prioritize the safety and security of everyone who is in this country and we don't prioritize those of criminals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, honorable members, I think we must also acknowledge that this is a public hearing. There is still going to be deliberations that are going to take place after we have we are done with the public hearings, where we are going to politic and do close by close. Um, I would plead that the comrades, the, 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 four, the members that have raised their hands, the time to entertain this, presentation is now over. We will still come back to the uh, to, to all the presentations when we deal with the deliberations. Can we move to the next presentation? Can you allow me to, uh, can you allow me uh, honorable members to move to the next presentation? I know that the presentation, the last presentation has raised a lot of issues and I still think that those issues are still going to be raised when when we when we do the deliberations. But the risk that we have now, if we if we allow members to come back, then there is going to be a right of reply. We might not be able to finish. Uh, please, honourable members. Great, chair. Um, okay, okay. It's, it's not okay. It's, 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 uh, uh, I understand, Chair. That. Yes. No, I'm, I'm saying, Chair, I, I support what you are saying, that you must not entertain um, it more further due to time constraints. We have time to discuss these matters. Just that, Chair, when you come for a presentation unprepared, you become more emotional and sarcastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, honorable members, for your understanding. Uh, can you go to the Embrace project? Can you go to the Embrace project? Yes. 